Hello, and welcome to Broads and Books. I'm Erin. And I'm Amy. And this is a special Broads and Books bonus episode. Today on the Broads Talk Books With, we've got journalist and author Liz Lenz. I recommended her book Godland in episode 78, plus she writes an email series called Men Yell at Me, which title's terrific. Beyond that, terrific. So terrific. Yes. And Iowa native. You gotta love that. Absolutely. We got Liz on Zoom, and she told us about her favorite books, past and present, Ethical Escapism. Mm-hmm. Copyright. Yeah, copyright. Which we're copyrighting, Love that yeah. phrase. And even a cocktail plus show combo, which I love. Yeah. We put all the books Liz mentions in the show notes so you can add them all to your to-be-read pile. And now here's our interview with Liz Lenz. I'm picturing like a family photo with like the big, big dog and then the tiny dog and the cat. So, I mean, the cat's not going to fuck around with a photo, but the, yes, I mean, my, my Malamute is probably going to be over a hundred pounds, probably over 130 pounds. And my little dog, who is a Dachshund Maltese mix, like she's like six pounds and that's probably as big as she's going to get. So I was like, big, 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 big dog. it's hilarious to me. Yeah. I think it's really funny. I've been mm-hmm. alone too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a, um, a couple really big cats and then a kitten. And the kitten oh. keeps trying to ride one of the big cats. <gasps> so I'm picturing your little dog, like trying to ride the big dog. So my mom sent me uh, a link to like a like a backpack for big dogs that I can put my little dog inside oh. of. So- <laughs> she was like look at this thing and I'm like are you fucking kidding me and you then I was like oh people. I'm gonna do that yeah yeah I'm gonna go on like a hike you know and then shove my little dog in a little carrier and <laughs> get an Instagram influencer with that shit <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. also I wanted to show Aaron and I have, both have these mugs oh. dolly action <gasps> It's Dolly's birthday! It is! Oh it's her God. 75th birthday! Yes, oh, today! Yeah. Yes, of course she's a Capricorn. And yeah, and that's who I named my dog after, my new dog, Dolly the Malamute. It's perfect. Yes. It's perfect, yeah. Tiny yeah. little Jolene on the back, that's great. Uh, yes. <laughs> I know. Jolene keeps stealing shit from Dolly, which is just perfect. That sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So thinking about uh, some of your favorite books and books that have influenced yes. you over time, thinking about you as a kid and a teen, do you remember mm. a particular favorite book or a couple favorite books? So, yeah. So I was a huge reader as a kid and I was, um, I was homeschooled, which is so interesting because you know, I grew up being like, I'm never going to homeschool my kids. And then the pandemic hit. And then all of a sudden my children have like at least one part of a year of their life where they had to like experience what it was like for me as a kid a little bit, where it's just like, go outside, play by yourself. Um, (laughs) Which was like how my mom homeschooled us. So I'm one of eight kids. And so I, you know, I was in so many ways, I was lucky enough to just be left to my own devices and read and just read books. And I will say, um, you know, Emily of New Moon of course, I think was very, very instrumental in defining my sense of self, you know, like I, um, because it's about a girl who just dreams of stories and uh, feels kind of lost and alone. And I think, you know, being, being a child is weirdly a very isolating experience. You know, obviously I wasn't alone. I had seven brothers and sisters. Well, one of the things that we've talked about a lot on the podcast or we've had listeners mention to us is like they might have hit a roadblock in their reading life, particularly with things that were labeled as classics that mm. they were either assigned to read or felt like they had to read. Do you remember a classic that you struggled with? You know, so because I was homeschooled, I didn't have that school experience. So I was really uh, able to be freed up in so many ways to just experience books on my own, in my own terms. But I do, so I was homeschooled until high school. And I do remember the first time I struggled with a book, like 
being so 16 and the book was uncle tom's cabin and you know it's it's quote unquote this well it was being sold to me as a great work of literature and i'm reading it and i'm like this is like i was like this is not only poorly written also talk about propaganda Mm -hmm. but like i mean but you know but like for for white white saviorism is clear what kind of propaganda like i'm very pro ending slavery but like also it was like very you know like white saviorist propaganda and I, I remember reading and being like, God, this book actually sucks. And it was the first time like I read a book with spark notes to get me through. And I felt like such a cheater, you know, cause I'm like a super nerd 16 year old. And I'm like, Oh my God, I had to have help reading this book. And I was like, nobody read it. You're the only one who read it. And then I was an English lit major in college. And I remember like talking about this book with one of my professors and her just being like, Oh yeah that book's so unreadable and such garbage. And I was like, it was the first time I'd ever really heard anybody like trash a classic. And it was freeing as hell. What, um, either as a younger kid or in college, were there uh, authors or books that made you want to be a writer? Yes. Um, so I mentioned I was an English literature major. My minor was in uh, Russian history and language. And it was one of the best decisions I ever did. And he taught this Eastern European literature class where he had us read Milan Kundera. Mm-hmm. And he had us read um, Unbearable Lightness of Being. And I, I, I know people feel very complicated about the way he portrays women and everything but I can tell you reading that book and I still reread it uh once a year um every year um I pick that book up and read it I have three copies of the book one is marked up so much the other I got uh because I couldn't find my first copy (laughs) (laughs) and so it's like my backup copy if I can't find my first copy and then I have a third copy that circulates between me and my two um and my three best college friends and we pass it um between each other um because we all kind of read it at the same time and it was that time when we all became friends and we are lifelong friends you for the longest time I wanted to write like Kundera um which is always a mistake don't try to write like your heroes um and you know I have a lot of like short stories I wrote in college um where they're just basically unbearable lightness of being knockoffs but I I think it was one of the first times that I experienced writing uh reading a book that functioned as fiction and nonfiction, does that make sense? Where it really kind of walked, it's essayistic fiction. And I think the way that I write is, um, is essayistic journalism, which is so obnoxious to like define yourself as a writer. So I apologize, but I do think a lot about Kundera and, um, and the way that he writes and it is a huge influence in the way that I think and write. Yeah. Thinking a little bit more recent now, Mm -hmm. um, how many books would you say are on your to be read pile (laughs) and are there any that you can share? Yeah, so I, every year around um, kind of the holidays and the beginning of January, I pick a classic or two, classic or two that I haven't read, and uh, I read them, and um, so I just got through The Good Soldier, which I'd never read before, and just found it profoundly interesting um and then i reread the scarlet letter which i'd read in high school and i did not find it as interesting the second time around i was like yeah 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 she's a fallen woman like who cares you know what i mean like give us something else um he deserves someone better but um and i just read what you're going through by secret nunez um which was incredible um, again, essayistic fiction, love that. Um, I also have the book, um, the autobiography of Carson McCullers, queued up, ready to go um, on my list. And I'm trying to think, my list, you know, I kind of have 
like just stacks and stacks of books, like I think any avid reader. And then, um, but if something will strike my fancy, then I'll, um, you know, I'll circle back or go get a new book. Or if I'm really struggling to get it, because it's pandemic, you know, people are having a really hard time. I'm having a really hard time having my interest held by books. Um, yeah. And I, and I also, um, for I'm I'm working on a, another book proposal, so I'm doing a lot of reading for that. Um, and so I've I've reread and read and reread Nora Ephron's Heartbreak, um, and probably will read it again just because it's such a short, furious little book that acts like a punch. And every time I read it, I find something new um, that delights. It's just delightful and funny and real. But I really want to reread Dostoevsky's *The Idiot*, um, and I hope to read that very soon. Um, I because I read it in in college. It, there, I remember um, my professor saying something about like you know if you read any writer enough, you understand the problem they're trying to sort out. Mm. And I think especially in uh, this time in American history, I've found it really interesting to read and reread those um, those Eastern European books. But I'm also reading new books. Like I'm really excited. My friend Rachel Yoder's Night Bitch is coming out this year. I'm yeah. so excited for that book. So yeah. of the books that you um, have read either recently or in the, the last year, maybe during the pandemic, any particular book that you think really surprised you? What book surprised you? know, I read a lot of ton of French. I um, just, because, I, I mean, I love a good, who doesn't love a good mystery? It's fine if you don't love a good mystery. Oh, no, um, I love her. Love her yes. yes, yes. And I just found them so easy to escape into, you know, mm -hmm. without feeling like I was running away from something. Does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, it felt like ethical escapism, <laughs> which, is probably, <laughs> which is probably just bullshit. Like, I'm just saying it to myself to make myself feel bad. But can but, we use that term just going yes, forward? Yes, yeah. go for ethical it. Escapism I, is terrific. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think we want a world that, uh, you know, or I want, I don't care if the people in it are good or bad or somehow in, in between. I want writing that pulls me in. Um, and, and if, you know, and if for some reason a book is unable to do that because of my own mindset, you know, it's not always, it's not the writer. Um, sometimes it's just me or, or because of everything that's going on, then I just really don't want to be there. So, um, Tana French in, in reading all of her books, this, not all of her books, I think I read four of them, were what kind of kept me reading. And then I read The Good Indian, oh. uh, which I, I just picked up. I just picked it up after the ton of French books because I saw it at my bookstore and I remembered, I was like, oh, I've seen people talking about that. And I sat down to read it and I could not put it down. Ooh, it, it, it's in my next library hall, I think. It's, yeah. I, I didn't, I, I don't know what I expected. I just picked it up and, and it's, it's a horror novel. It's, but it's just, mm. is it, is it okay to say it's beautiful and upsetting wow. and wild and, and um, it, it's, it's so great. I think that book totally took me by surprise. Um, I also say the good soldier, you know, when I do the read, reread a classic experiment, what it teaches me is that often the books we think of as like super old and boring really aren't like they're, they're like ferociously written. And, um, I, re I remember reading Lady Chatterley's Lover two years ago and being like, it's full of dick jokes. Like I would have read it sooner if somebody had told me it's basically just like D. H. Lawrence, like coming up with a million different synonyms for dicks. Like I would have done it. Just let me know. I mean, same with Madame Bovary. It's just a hateful woman fucking around. Love it. Um, those are great blurbs for the front cover of those books. <laughs> I know, I <laughs> right? 
how do you normally find your book recommendations? Well, I'm lucky enough to have a million writer friends. Um, so I read what they're reading. I read what they suggest. Um, oh, oh, another book that I have queued up that I'm really excited about is called Keep the Dead Close. Um, a friend recommended it to me. I have a lot, a, a lot of friends who are crime writers. Um, and so they're always recommending great books. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just kind of, I don't know. I just read whatever they're reading or try to read their books. Um, you know, oh, also my friend Kelsey McKinney has this book coming out this year. You want to talk about like ethical escapism. It's called God Save the Girls. And it's about the these two girls who are daughters of a mega church pastor and scandal in the church ensues and it's about how they deal with it. And it's like it's being pulled into, you know, the hot world of Baptist Texas. And you're just you're so present in that world, but you're also dealing with, you know, like good and evil and redemption and 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 fathers and daughters and so it pulls you in but gives you uh, a lot to chew on so yeah I mean I, I'm so lucky that like I, I never am without a book to read because um, somebody's always writing something or um, reading something and that's and then whenever I feel lost I go back to my comfort blankets yeah. that's what we've been doing as well Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So thinking about, you know, you mentioned religion. We recommended Godland in oh, good. Thank one of you. Our last episodes. And both Aaron and I now read Men Yell at Me religiously, which is wonderful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, thank you. That's so nice. What do you think there's any particular books or authors that inspire your writing? I know you've talked a little bit about that, but any special touch points that you always return to? You know, I like to read different writers for different things. Um, so if I am struggling with something, um, I will pick up different writers um, and read and reread them. So, um, I mean, for example, I, I had the luck and honor of being edited by Gia Tolentino, who is an incredible writer. And I think that her work does this thing really well where it, it goes from scene to thought so seamlessly where you always feel grounded in an experience, but you're also, uh, you're also following a train of thought, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so, um, whenever I struggle with those, uh, transitions, I, um, I, I pick up her work and just read it and reread it. Um, I, so, um, I also try to be funny in my writing and whenever I'm struggling with lines or quippy senses of humor, I have two collections of Dolly, or of, I'm saying Dolly, because I looked at my dog, but um, Molly, Molly Ivins, and I pick up her work and I flip through it. I read it like the Bible. And um, so there's so many other writers. I mean, Taffy Ackner does structure very well. Yeah. And so whenever I'm trying to think about like, how am I going to structure this or how do I do, um, you know, how do I stack research on top of ideas on top of, I just, I like to go back to her. And also she does the transition between the story and the self so well. Yeah. Um, I read Pamela Koloff, who's an incredible journalist, because she does this magic. It's this magical thing where you're reading her writing and it's very vivid and you're in a scene and if you think about it you're like wait a minute how does she know this like she's in the head of somebody describing a scene so i go back to her work for that and yeah i guess it kind of just depends on what i'm working on what i'm trying to accomplish um and then that depends on who I read and who I reread. Well, what would you say is one of your most memorable fan interactions? And this could be, you know, maybe pre-pandemic if you had more opportunity <laughs> to meet people or even now if there's been an email exchange or something. Let's do positive. Um, <laughs> 
I imagine you get a lot of negative considering the content you write about. I yeah. do. I do. And it's, um, it comes and goes in waves. Um, you know, I would say, um, right now we're in a lull. That's not an invitation. Um, but, <laughs> But um, I'm in a little bit of a lull. Uh, so yes, it comes and goes in waves. Um, but I will say, I, I find it, when I put out Guideline last year, um, a, friend of, a friend of a friend told me, um, books have a life of their own. And she's like, you know, so you launch a book, you don't know what's gonna happen. And what is fascinating to me is the life that Godland has had um, that I never anticipated for it. So I think it's always memorable to me when I will get a email from somebody who's like, hey, I picked up Godland at the library and um, you know, I'm leaving my marriage, I'm leaving my church. This is really, you know, uh, just like has been so wonderful and interesting. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so terrible because, you know, people are like, yeah, they're like, you know, I'm like, I'm dealing with these things you're dealing with. But it's also so cool, you know, to see um, people interact. Um, I will say, too, another thing that's always memorable is, was that last year or was it 2018? I wrote an essay called, Now That I'm Divorced, I'm Never Cooking for a Man Again, which is a little like tongue in cheek <laughs> of an essay. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I like, I love, I still get emails from women about that. And it is, they're always just the best emails. Um, I, I, I will say, okay, so memorable, memorable. I have um, a fan who is an 80 year old uh, Midwestern grandma and she sends me emails every like probably about once a month and has been for about a year and a half now. It, they're not always positive. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I think that's great. I think it's incredible. I'm, I just, it's, it's, it's so, it's just, yeah, it's great. And I love hearing from people. Do you think there's a book that you think everyone should read? No. Oh. Uh, no, unequivocally, no. I, you know, I think it's, I think it is arrogant to pretend that every book is going to speak to every person. I don't think there is, you know, a universal human experience, uh, which is, you know, weird because like I'm a writer, so I write about human experience. But, um, you know, I think something that especially this year has been teaching me over and over is how really shattered we are as a world and as a society. And that, you know, for me to pretend like there's a, a story that would be meaningful to everyone when I don't know everyone's story is not something that I would do. Um, and that's actually, I think that's a very different answer than I would have given you last year at this time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, the way that the pandemic has changed our reading, our, you know, consumption of things. Yeah. And I, you know, also, again, to plug my book, uh, my friend Matthew Celestis's book, Craft in the Real World, which I still haven't read, but I know what he's writing about, you know, is just to hear him talk about writing workshops and writing advice um, and how it really... Uh, it really levels voices, especially of people of color, and it really levels experiences and not just levels erases like different ways of writing and different ways of approaching form and craft and you know so that's really kind of made me think like how I think about story how I think about structure you know if I find something interesting what is it might say more about me than it actually does about the book yeah you know, so I, I think that's something that I'm learning um, and exploring as I grow as a human being, so. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that we talk about at the end of our episodes is uh, a current pop culture obsession we have, whether it's a podcast, music, TV, movie. Is there something that you're obsessed with right now? Yes, it's uh, The Heart of Dixie. <laughs> 
<laughs> do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. great, good. Okay. <laughs> So for people who don't know, it is a TV show with Rachel Bilson in it, <laughs> and she is a surgeon, and she goes, she's like a New York City surgeon, and then has to go back to this small town in Alabama and, um, and run her f- surprise, it's okay, you learn this in the first couple episodes, but run her, her father's like old practice, general practice. And it's, you know, it's truly lifetime original, big city girl in a small town. But it has, it's better than it has any right to be. Like, that premise you would think is going to be bullshit. Okay, maybe it kind of is. But it's also really fun. And it's delightful. And, like, there's so many people from Friday Night Lights in it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's just like, oh, where have they been? Oh, here they are. Oh, okay. Okay. And it's just fun. Like it's not uh it's not even ethical escapism. It's just escapism. So. There's a need for that too. There's like a lot of hot men in it. And okay. you know, I've been single for like most of pandemic, so <laughs> it's like let it happen. And if you need a cocktail drink to go along with it, yes. may I recommend the Yellow Hammer, which is a, a an Alabama treat. They drink it at tailgates, um, but it's like, oh my god, it's it's gonna get you fucked up. It is like <laughs> rum and uh, like all sorts of other things, and then like pineapple juice, and then grenadine, and it's, mm-hmm. yeah. So there you go, a, a show and a cocktail. A drink and a show, that's my kind of yeah, recommendation right exactly there. That's what we need, yes. Erin, it's always great to talk to another Iowa writer. It is. Yeah. It is. That was wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I, can we start with the dogs' names? Yeah. Dolly and Jolene. It was terrific. Um, we showed her our Dolly Parton mugs. Yes. Turned out it was Dolly's birthday. We didn't even know that. We didn't know. Which was bad on that's, our part. Yeah, we should have known that. Yeah, I don't that even know why I was happy when yeah. I said that. Yeah. And yeah, just picturing her little dog in a little backpack made me... Really happy. Yeah, it was started off a great. nice moment. <laughs> nice moment. I like too that she, you know, she talks about this in Godland and elsewhere that you know she was homeschooled for a good portion of her education, so kind of it gave a new spin on reading classics. You know, she didn't have to do a lot of that until high school, mm-hmm. and maybe because of that, once she got to high school and realized one of the books she read she didn't like. She had no bones about saying, like, this isn't good. I don't like this. Which is, that's amazing to already Mm -hmm. have that at that age. Mm -hmm. And I like that, you know, she's kind of looked back now and made this goal of reading some classics she missed every year. That's something I've thought about doing before, too. You know, you do always Mm -hmm. feel like you're missing a few important pieces, but... It's kind of cool how she's set that goal and Absolutely. working towards it. Yeah. Um, I really liked, we mentioned this, she coined the term ethical escapism. We're going to run with it. I like that idea, especially with, you know, thrillers and other stuff during the pandemic. We, we've said mo- many times before, it shouldn't matter what genre, it shouldn't no. matter anything. There's no guilt about what you read, mm-hmm. whatever you read and whatever you enjoy. Go for it. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Enjoy yourself. Exactly. Treat yourself. If you like putting together puzzles do it do it if you like paint by numbers damn do it do it if you like coloring stickers do it if you like legos do Do it it. (laughs) definitely on that one (laughs) and that was one of her great recommendations was the tv show heart of dixie and a cocktail to go with it which i looked up the recipe and i included the link in the show notes and holy shit there's a lot of alcohol in there wow. so no wonder she was saying you're gonna get effed up because you are you are it's just it's a guarantee and that's sometimes what you need it's <laughs> so to have a hand delivered is just justification so thank you Perfect. liz lens yeah for a a good watch and a way to get messed up <laughs> i didn't go in I... wanting that but i'm glad i have it <laughs> Well, guess what? We'll be back next Wednesday with our regular weekly themed episodes. In the meantime, you can head to our website, broadsandbooks.com, and check out all of our other bonus episodes with some amazing authors. So many great authors. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, our website, YouTube, 
We're everywhere. Everywhere. No, we're not hiding, as you've said before. We are not hiding. <laughs> that is not what we're up to. We are plain sight. Happy reading. Happy reading.